for joining today's webinar. Welcome to Zoom. My name is Lindsay and I am the editor of Kitchens, Bedrooms and Bathrooms magazine and e3rooms.com. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to plan your perfect kitchen extension. This is the latest in a series of the kitchen sessions brought to you by these three rooms. If you missed our last session on how to plan a kitchen now, you can catch up on that on our YouTube channel um, and we'll pop a link to that in the chat below. So you can watch this session which has been recorded and the previous session in your own time um, whenever you fancy. So let me introduce you to my panel today for the session. I am here with Helen Galutu from Berlin's in Chelmsford. Hi, Helen. Hi, Lindsay. And Alex is there. Hopefully his audio is now connected, um, but video wonders of tech is not working for today. We'll try with that. But hi, Alex Saint, um, who's the head designer at Kitchen Architecture in Cheshire. Hi there. Hi there. Um, so kitchen extensions, why are we talking about that today? Um, I think when I talk to homeowners from um, the magazine, during interviews for the magazine, as well as these three rooms, the kitchen extension is often the project that they're working on or that's the project that they've done. Um, often with, I want more space, I want more space for entertaining, I want connections to the garden, those sorts of things often crop up um, for the why they want to extend. Um, and I think probably now, even if people haven't um, thought about extending before, they might have looked around their space during the last few months and thought they need more space for the family, for home working, et cetera, et cetera. So Helen, I'm gonna start with you. Given um, the way of the world right now, do you um, think lots of people are thinking about extending, is it something that you come up with with your clients, people coming into the showroom, is that the type of project they want to do? Yeah, most definitely. We actually uh, call them projects uh, working from plans because um, what people do is they have to get architectural plans and bring them in and we can work a design out within that. But it's very, it's very common now, um, I'd say 50% of our clients are actually doing extensions. Mm -hmm. What's the main driver for that? What do they want most? Yeah, really, what they're after is firstly a social area. Um, so I think these family rooms um, are for people who have got children, they want to be part of it rather than being a separate room cooking. You know, the kids are doing their homework, they're getting involved with that, but also cooking the dinner, having a family area there. Um, I think that a lot of social now, so a lot of people are coming over with friends, they're having wine, cooking is, is obviously everywhere, all over the telly with certain cooking programs and stuff, so people are experimenting a lot more um, and, and getting more involved in that, so they need a room that's actually going to combine everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll come on to how you know that room that newly extended space can be best designed to suit different functions um, okay. because more often than not they have to fit a lot of different functions yeah. so where really should you start Helen when you're thinking about a kitchen extension you know you're looking around at the space that you've got what what should be going through your head well you have to think what you want to gain out of it um, so obviously if it's more space, if it is a family area, maybe a, a sort of a snug uh, TV room, if you want more of a social area, whether it's an island with seating around. Um, so firstly, you have to really think what you want to get out of it and are you going to get everything that you need out of that? I mean, once you've decided that, that the kind of process of going along it's like I say, you will have to contact an architect um, and he will do drawings and so forth and then they will have to submit plans. Um, and it, it's a very awkward but easy when you know how. I mean, this is what we do, so we do it every day of the week. But for someone who's never done this before, um, it can be quite difficult. Um, but you'd have to start off with the architect's plans, getting planning permission, and then from there, we could obviously discuss about what design you'd like um, and what you want to achieve. 
Mm -hmm. So is it a good idea, Alex? I'll come to you. Hello. Um, Hello. Talking about looking around the space, is it a good idea to have a sort of wish list in mind um, of you know how what you want out of it, and then to take that to a professional who might be able to help bring your ideas to life? Yes, um, uh, you know certainly, um, uh, but I'd probably I'd probably say more sort of wish list. Uh, as sort of Helen's rightly said, a wish list of what you want to get out of it. Possibly not necessarily a wish list of every single gizmo and piece of furniture and etc. that you want to get in. Um, sometimes you know you'll end up not seeing the wood for the trees. Um, and you know actually, when you first start looking at a space, it's about getting the space right with a holistic approach and not trying to cram in a million ideas that you've seen on Pinterest um, or, or the internet. Um, so yeah, absolutely a wish list, but um, I think, um, yeah, it's more for the lifestyle that you want to get out of that space as opposed to, um, uh, yeah, any, any sort of specific ideas on, on furniture. You talk about a holistic space. So what's the best way to look at the space and start thinking about what it could actually become? Um, it, it, it's, I mean, you know, you know, essentially, if we're talking about sort of kitchen extensions, you, you know, I mean, for the last sort of 15 years, you know, most of our projects have always been extensions, you know, uh, or, or they're in a new build, you know, a new build space. Um, and, you know, what we're not doing is coming into an, an open plan living space and just taking over with a kitchen. You know, it's not about designing the biggest kitchen that you can into a space. Uh, you know, you know, is there is there dining going in there? Is there living seating going in there? Is there an area for the kids? Uh, so the idea is, how, how do we drop this this functional kitchen in? Um, but you know, actually, um, you know, just don't completely take over. It's it's about the lifestyle we're creating, not just about designing the biggest, the, you know, the biggest baddest kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the like you say, the kitchen really needs to be thought about in tandem with the actual structural extension side of the project. 100%, you know, um, you know, and a good, a good architect worth their salt, you know, um, should, should be doing that as they, as they draw up these spaces for you. Um, but certainly I think, um, you know, you need to get your, your kitchen specialist involved quite early. You know, what you sometimes find with architects is, you know, they're absolutely experts at what they do um, and they're experts at the exterior and the actual building. Sometimes, because that so much of their role involves, you know, exterior sort of building work and, and frankly, a lot of paperwork, um, they don't actually have as much, as, as much experience as somebody like myself, Helen, in terms of internal planning, you know, actually internally planning those living spaces um, and understanding the choreography and the uh, you know and the way families interact in those spaces. Some will, some won't. <laughs> Not tarnishing everybody with the same brush, but um, yeah, you know the, the 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 kitchen the kitchen guys need to be involved quite early to get you know to um, to make sure what what's being dropped in there and where the doors are going, etc., are going to allow for a you know a sociable functional kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Alex there. Um, I mean, we have this a lot where you get architectural drawings and exactly what Alex said, the door's in the wrong place. Obviously, it might be 550 mil when the depth of um, a regular base cabinet is 600. Um, so if we do get in, in in the early stages, then what that means is if we look at it from a kitchen point of view rather than an architectural point of view, we can advise well, maybe could you move the window up or can you change the door? Because it can actually really affect the run of a kitchen. Um, so Alex is 100% right there. It's a fine balance because, you know, you do need to get your planning and your architectural drawings, but we need to come in at that point before the actual build starts. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything that we can input, we need to do it then before anything's built. Because it's the same with um, electrical points, things like this. People have to be very careful. They're not paying twice for the same thing. So, you know, they're going to get a builder come in, they've got the electrical points, and then all of a sudden when we design the kitchen, it doesn't work. Um, so it, the two do need to go in tandem together as well. So, yeah. Well, from a, from a homeowner's point of view and the, the guys that are tuning in today, 
you really need to think very early on about what you want and then who you want to work with you. So rather than like you say, getting an architect or a builder or whoever in first and then a few months later getting the kitchen designer on board, it's really a front end sort of um, workload when it comes to this sort of project. Is that right, Helen? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is very, very involved. And um, I think cost has to be a big factor because I do find with a lot of clients, um, they're unrealistic because there is a lot of these TV shows of um, doing makeovers and reinventing. It's not a realistic flight at price of what these projects actually cost. And they, if you're not careful, they can spiral out of control very easily. Mm -hmm. What I do tend to find um, is sometimes people haven't budgeted correctly for what they're after um, and then they over um, pay on on the actual build side of it and then what you're left with they've got the small budget for the actual kitchen which is the main part that everyone sees so they end up scrimping on things like that and that's a real shame you know because no one walks into an extension or a new build and say the walls look fabulous you know but when they walk into the kitchen, you want that wow factor. Um, so you do, one, one piece of advice I would give is think realistically about how much things cost. Um, because by the time you add all the factors in there, it can be a lot more than what you actually thought when you started out. Mm -hmm. Alex, on that point, I just want to know your input. It can be quite hard for people to set a budget for this sort of a project because there are so many different variables in terms of the construction, the site, as well as the kitchen and the, the size of the space, etc. So what's your kind of tip on where to start when thinking how much things could actually cost? Um, that's obviously several, several ways you can do it and several ways you can approach it. I mean, I think, you know, if you can get solid recommendations from friends and families pointing you in the right directions of architects, and contractors who have, you know, you you have seen the space that they've created. You know they can deliver what they say they that they're going to deliver. Um, that's gonna, you know, you're gonna be able to have a very um, ho hopefully sort of frank conversation with them along the lines of, I want what I've seen at number twelve down the road. What am I looking at? You know, um, it, 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 you know, you frankly, you, you have to just, you know, it's not a very British thing to talk money. Um, but yeah, if you don't want to end up in the situation that, that, that Helen mentioned, you know, you, you're going to have to have those conversations quite early on um, and put your expectations across and hopefully allow, you know, these recommended professionals who you know can deliver, um, manage those expectations. Um, you, you know, you can, you can read up all sorts of guidelines on how much an extension can cost you per square meter, um, you know, how much a wood floor costs per feet and, and and the rest of it but frankly it's all about your expectations you know and what level of finish you want to achieve what level of uh, kitchen you want and appliances and, and flooring and lighting and, and all the rest of it there's a lot to take in mm -hmm. uh, you know a, um, a good architect should be able to do all of that for you in theory um, so again you know a nice solid recommendation of um, of somebody um, you know in theory they're the person to guide you but ultimately it's not till you get out there and, uh, and uh, you know honest and upfront with with those individual people that you're going to get the real true picture mm -hmm. you mentioned you know someone down the street's done an extension I want that as kind of an inspiration almost of where um, the idea for the project might have come from. Where else can people get inspiration? What's your experience of that? I'll ask you that, Helen, first. Um, well, there's many various places. Um, you've got uh, magazines, uh, the social media, Instagram, stuff like that is great. A lot of people use Pinterest, which I saw Alex laughing earlier, um, because when you talk about Pinterest, a lot of the stuff on there is actually American. So a lot of people come up with this stuff that they want that actually is maybe a little bit more difficult to deliver because they have different size appliances and, and various stuff. Um, depending on what company you go to, Berlain's is very bespoke, so it's handmade cabinetry, so we can make any size. Um, but again, when people start going into curves and 
uh, anything can be done, but again, it is going to push the budget. So, you know, that's another thing to be sort of realistic about. And like you say, you know, you do go into friend, friends' kitchens and sometimes you find things you like and things you don't like. It is a personal preference on the style of kitchen um, that I think you're after. And I think that's another thing early on that maybe you should look at. Do you like the modern style, the handleless, the gloss, the German type kitchen? Or are you looking to... Oh. We slightly lost her. The bell passing. So it, it's about the look as well that you, that you want to achieve within the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alex, where, where do you find that clients um, that come to you have inspiration from? Sorry, Lindsay, just... Oh, uh, sorry, did I cut out there? I just said when um, clients come to you, what sort of type of extension are um, people, you know, mostly doing? Um, t t t a, a, a typical project for us um, would be a uh, you know a, a more sort of contemporary style uh, box on, on on the back of a of a period you know Victorian or Edwardian property um, you know th that would be a, a very you know um, four out of five <laughs> projects you know we, we have a showroom up in Cheshire here we have a showroom in in, in London um, you know almost it feels like nine out of ten of your projects in London are, are, are that style. Um, and, um, you know, so, so that, that would be our, our bread and butter, um, you know, where, where we are in the Northwest, that there is a lot of new build projects, um, a, a, as well. I uh, know we're not talking about that today, but, um, you know, um, so yeah, it, it, it's typically, typically a more sort of square contemporary space, um, which gives you the, the contemporary lifestyle of the open plan living and then retaining the more sort of period features of the home in the front reception rooms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Helen, is that a similar um, feel for the types of extension that you find that you are planning kitchens within? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, we do a lot of um, sort of the orangery type with the lantern roofs to let the light in, um, a lot of big fivefold doors on the back, so you get that inside outside feel and space. Um, Personally, I love the mixture of the contemporary and the traditional. Um, so, you know, we do sort of slab doors that are more contemporary, but then we also do the traditional shaker. Um, but yeah, we're definitely getting the same type. But then also, even today, I've seen a client that's in a grade two listed building, wants to keep the tradition, the period feel to that. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of extra building and extensions. It's massive at the moment. And I do think what with, you know, people thinking now, shall we move or shall we extend and stay where we are? So stamp duty and things like that are a big thing that if people sold, you know, they've got to spend all this money out in stamp duty anyway. So are they better off to just stay put? and make the investment in the property that they've got there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned stamp duty. Another thing I want to come on to, and maybe something that's encouraged more people um, in most recent years to improve rather than move by extending, is um, permitted development rights. So you can actually build quite a, a significant size on, on your property without formal planning permission. Um, Alex, do you want to just briefly explain what permitted development allows you to do in terms of a, a kitchen extension? Yes, so uh, essentially, um, you know, there is, um, there is slightly different uh, parameters for, for different, different types of, of property. Um, but essentially, it allows you to, um, you know, to, to do an extension on your home without the need for um, planning permission. Um, you know, typically it would be something along the lines of, you know, from the side of the, the side of the period, the property, you're allowed to go out no more than 50% of the original width. Um, and typically it's around three to four meters, um, back, you know, um, dependent on neighbor's boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. There, there, there's, you know, it, it, it's quite a, it's quite a, um, a, a long list of parameters but actually if you google it and pull it up it, it reads through quite simply actually um 
And then on the styling of the extension, it just depends um, on, so for example, if you've got a red brick home, but you want a white rendered extension, just the fact that you want it rendered would mean that you would actually then have to add the planning permission on just for that one little detail. So th th there's little there's little caveats in there um, uh, that you that you have to sort of be careful of, but essentially um, it allows you to yeah to do what would actually be a typically you know a typical sort of sized extension um, that you you see you know <laughs> on, yeah that you see on these TV shows and you see at your, your friends' houses. With, 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 with possibly without the, the need for planning permission. Mm -hmm. And then um, that actually allows you to build, as I said, a, a quite a sizable extension really. But if someone has a, a small space or something say like a side return that's not being used, can we talk a little bit about smaller extensions and how actually that could really transform the interior of the space? Um, Alex, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, you know, if you, um, you know, if you've got experienced, um, experienced space planners involved, um, you know, what seems like a small amount of space can, can make a huge difference to how you use that room. You know, if there was a small side um, extension that, you know, uh, perhaps it was being used as um, some sort of I don't know utility space or a or a gym or or, or whatever for for a you know a previous owner of that home, you know actually taking that wall through um, could be the difference between you fitting an island into the living space, for example, you know which are obviously ex extremely popular mm -hmm. um, and yeah you know the vast majority of kitchens you see on you know. Pinterest and all the rest of it will have the islands in um you know so gaining what could only be you know it could be an extra meter it could be an extra meter and a half on the side of the home could could be all the difference um between you know it, it's a small space but now it's a it's a it's a small space but still open plan you know and you've still got the the social feel of of, of working around an island for example yeah so the island is key that's one of the things that is well it's key for a lot of people a lot of people that i mm. talk to want an island it's real kind of aspirational dream feature within the kitchen the other thing that i hear often is that they want uh, people want a great connection to the outdoors and probably that's never been more important than ever because of what's happened in recent months people if they ha have outdoor space they want to be able to you know feel connected so helen have you got any ideas on how people can use a, an extension and their kitchen design to maximize that feeling of being connected to the outside yeah sure i mean like i mentioned earlier i think the bifolds now and the whole sort of back of the house a lot of people if they're really trying to get that feel um will do that mm -hmm. things like a lot of porcelain tiles and so forth you get now you can actually do the same tiles outside as inside so you can keep the continuity going. Um, so yeah, I'd say more, you know, just trying to incorporate both of them. So it's almost trying to make it one space as opposed to, um, you know, separate there. But I mean, that's very, very common now. I mean, people, the bifold doors have, have really opened it up. Um, yeah, we've got some great project examples that I'm going to show just in a minute. But before I do that, um, and by the way, if anyone does have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box and we'll come to them in about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, I just want to talk to you, Helen, you mentioned about the glazing. What about yeah. the flow throughout the space? Um, you mentioned flooring. Are there any other ways that you really need to think about the flow through yeah. indoors as well as out? Um, we was having a discussion with a client the other day um, and I think there's a lot of other factors as well as just the cabinetry um, like you say the flooring the lighting um, that all makes a big difference to actually how it looks um, and even with like I said the lanterns in the ceiling or bellux windows you know is the space a dark space what way is it facing um, there's lots of things like that to take into consideration, but there's always ways of tweaking it that um, you can brighten it up or even with the colours you choose in the kitchen, um, go for something lighter or a nice white quartz worktop or something that's going to really lighten it up. Um, that makes a massive difference. So I would say lighting is, is very important. 
Mm -hmm. And Alex, um, for you mentioned open plan living, and um, mm -hmm. we can chat a little bit more about that. So flow is really important for open plan living to make sure everything feels nicely connected. And sight lines, I just want to talk about sight lines a little bit. And can you explain a bit about flow and sight lines within an open plan extension? Yeah, I could I could probably talk about this for about forty five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's you know to to me it's almost the most important thing in these open plan living spaces, you know, you're, you're trying to create a, a, a lifestyle essentially with, with a kitchen plan. So forget, you know, forget what the units look like, forget everything aesthetic about it. You know, how are people going to move and flow in that space? Um, you know, and, and therefore, you, you know, and, and it's what we, we, we sometimes call it almost here, like the choreography of the kitchen, you know, how, how are you going to move around it to cook a meal, but how are guests and family, going to interact with you while you do that you know um so you know the thing that we um we really encourage um and you, you'll you'll see basically time and again on the case studies and our on our website is this concept of cooking and working at islands looking out into the living space which you've spent you know obviously a, a massive amount of money building looking out into the garden that you spent a lot of money landscaping um and you know a it gets the cook looking out enjoying that investment but also what it does is when guests and family enter the room, they have eye contact with the cook. They don't feel the need to go walking into the function areas of the kitchen just to say good morning or to have a conversation with a glass of wine. Um, so what you're doing is you're, you've got the cook actually facing into the room um, and then you've got the guests and things will naturally perch at the island or at raised seating, um, stay out of the cook's way stay out of the functional areas, not leaning against the fridge, not leaning against the dishwasher. Um, and actually, in, you know, you've got this great big living space and you're all not stuck in one corner, mm -hmm. um, which is a great shame, which, you know, as beautiful as they can be, you know, things like range cookers, for example, just encourage people to, to, to cook looking at brick walls, which just seems like a real shame when you've spent all that money um, creating an open plan living space um, and an extension on the rear of the home and, and the glazing that people spend a lot of money on. Um, so yeah, getting you, getting you working, looking out into the living spaces, greeting the people as they come in the room. Um, and you know, that all helps, you know, so it actually it's the sociability and managing people within the room, which then helps create the functional kitchen because you're not all tripping over each other. And, mm -hmm. um Planning the kitchen and the layout within the extension, you know, I've, we've got this imaginary new extension in our heads. And then when it comes to actually planning the kitchen layout within that space can feel quite daunting. You know, do you put it closest to where the garden is? Do you put it, you know, in the darkest part of the room? Helen, what's the, the advice that you have around that? Well, getting back to what we said earlier, I think you have to first and foremost understand where you are and what your lifestyle is. So exactly what Alex is saying is, is right. But then on the flip side of that, if you go to someone who's got a young family, they've got children, um, and then you're talking about having the hob on the island where the children might sit there, it could be dangerous if they're small. Um, so there's various things and it depends what works for you. I mean, I always say I'm an assistant kitchen designer because I want to design my client's kitchen. I can walk into their space and design my own kitchen how I want it, but it's about us giving them what they need. So you have to take where you're at in your life. I mean, if, if you're older, for me personally, I've loved what Alex said, you know, it's, it's, it's fabulous. You know, I want to sit with my friends eating, socializing and stuff, but maybe that doesn't work for a young family. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to take into consideration what your, or what the client's needs are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and all the things that go with that, the plus, there's always pluses and minuses to everything. Um, but the islands and that social space is, is huge now. And I do think when people are looking to buy a new property, um, that is a big thing that they're looking for. You know, if they can buy a property that has all that involved, then it would definitely give it the upper hand from a sales point for a resale point of view as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come on to some of the projects because I think a lot of what we've been talking about is really um, well displayed in the projects that you have worked on. So I've got a couple from each of you. Um, so Helen, let me, I'm just going to share my screen so that we can share the, um, 
the first project we can talk about is one of yours, Helen. Yes. So this beautiful kitchen uh, in quite a large space, but it's, it looks to me quite more on the traditional side of things. So do you want to just talk about the property type and how the project actually came around and the brief for the kitchen and how that was achieved? Yeah, um, well, this particular couple are older. They were looking to brighten up the room, which I think you can see from the picture is exactly what they achieved. So they done the lantern ceiling, there's floods of light that's actually coming in there. Um, they wanted to go for more traditional, which is why they come to Berlin's. Um, we tend to specialise in more of the traditional look with the shaker style in frame, um, the beautiful oak that's inside uh, all the cabinetry. And like I said, it's all bespoke and handmade. Um, so this particular client, um, they wanted the Arga, but what we've done is we've actually put a mirrored flashback at the back there. So although their back is to the island when they're cooking, they can actually still interact um, with people who are sitting at the island. Um, and then obviously what we've done is we've teamed it with the sink straight behind it. So from a cooking point of view, it works perfectly. If you've got vegetables or stuff with hot water, you need to empty that in the sink there. Um, obviously they wanted a dining area as well. So the island was more for sort of drinks, socializing, breakfast, um, but we've still kept the dining room there as well. Because sometimes when you create a big room, it can look very sparse, you know, so you need to connect that as well and make sure that it gives you everything you need there isn't any wasted space because what you don't want is a huge area and you've got nothing in it it's not beneficial um, and then they've teamed up we've got the beautiful dark wood in the middle with the island that works perfectly with with the outside gives it contrast and um, the client absolutely loved it i mean i'm just over the moon I mean, what strikes me about this is how light it feels um, and, you know, it, it looks very timeless, but it just feels very light and connected to the outside. Absolutely. Because of the doors as well. So you've got the floods of light, the streams of light that comes in from there. Mm -hmm. um, but the good thing as well, if, for example, this particular house, if someone decided that they wanted to sell it, the great thing about our products is it's all hand painted, hand sprayed. In 10 years time, if, you know, the, the Bond Street blue goes out of fashion and, you know, pink comes in, then um, they can just respray the kitchen and you've got a brand new kitchen as well. It's timeless. It, it's just stunning. And with the skirting as well. I mean, for me personally, I love that. It looks so classy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just now, The next one I've got from you, Helen, is, is different to this. And the space for this one is really interesting. So I'm just going to put that one on the screen next um this is a really long narrow space and i think if a lot of people have say a victorian terrace house for example where they're very deep this is the sort of kind of space they might deal with um so talk me through how you've utilized this sort of space which is very different to the last one we looked at and how that project came together yeah, I mean, this is what we would call a typical kind of galley kitchen, although it's not completely as narrow as some galley kitchens can be. Um, but obviously, the only way we could extend this was to make it longer as opposed to wider. Um, so for that reason, an island would not work in this design because it's just not wide enough. It's not a square room as such. It's more rectangle. Um, but once again, we've kept kept it light with the uh, Velux windows coming in. Um, we've tried to put all the tall housing in one area, so that's together. Um, and then obviously you can see you've got the original exterior wall there, um, and then the new part of the build. So again, you've got to be very careful because you don't want this to look like two separate rooms. Um, and we've kept it light as it's going further down towards the door where the table is. Um, again, it's, it's beautiful, but very different. It's not a huge space and let's face it, most people um, don't have masses of space, you know, so you have to maximise and that's where the designer comes into play because obviously you want to give the best 
kitchen you can give within the space that you've got. We all love working on big projects, but it's not always possible. What I particularly like about this one, I'm just going to move on in a minute, but how the, there's you know, wall cabinets in one end of the space, which really makes it feel not cramped, because with a, a narrow space like that, you run the risk of it could feel quite cramped. Absolutely. And, and to be honest, Berlin's our style is not really wall cabinets. We do do wall cabinets if someone wants, um, but because our signature is the larger cabinets um, with the oak interior, and stuff like that. We don't tend to do so many wall cabinets here. We might have a bit of shelving like you can see, um, but there's actually loads of space within this kitchen, you know, with all the tall housings that's um, around the fridge. For the practical. So, now the next one, Alex, this, um, this is one of your projects. And I've got so many questions about this because it's so wow in terms of a very, very modern, glazed extension on a very traditional thatched property so tell me how that came about I mean it's very bold um, choice of extension for this sort of property yeah I mean we you know we did purposely send this over because it because it is it is different so um, and, it, and it yeah it certainly causes a bit of debate you know? so um, uh, but I mean you know talk about sort of bringing the outside in, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, connecting with the garden. This is about as extreme an example as you can um, hope to find. Um, what, what was interesting is, you know, it's a, a proper, you know, listed chocolate box thatched cottage, um, you know, and actually the, the, the spaces um, are extremely small inside. Um, the customer just wanted a you know, a, a, a larger, even though it's still not huge, but a, a, a larger, a larger kitchen to, to, to cook in. Um, actually, what was interesting was um, when they had a very sort of traditional style brick extension drawn for this, um, the, the, the council weren't biting at all um, and, and just felt um, it was just a you know an, an unnecessary addition to uh, to, to a listed building, um, and they went completely back to the drawing board with this concept of just a completely glass box. Um, and interestingly, the, um, the, the 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 council were were, um, were a lot more receptive to it. So at, at that point, um, that's when the 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 client made sure to get in contact with us. And just to work out how we drop a, you know, a functional kitchen into a into a glass box, how it's actually installed, how it actually works and goes in, um, and then we obviously just detailed it up. Mm. Um, I hope they've got a good window cleaner. Yeah, <laughs> it's. It, I mean, this this glass is it's got every type of treatment you can ever imagine on it. It's got the solar the solar treating on it, so you it doesn't get. You know, it, it does still get warm on a sunny day, but actually it doesn't get you know, anywhere near as hot as you'd think because it, it actually reflects the, the sun back and it's got the um, it's got the fancy coating on it as well to keep it, um, help keep it clean. You know, nothing, nothing sticks to it, basically. Mm -hmm. I love that because it really shows that just because you've got a traditional property doesn't mean that you have to go super traditional with the extension, obviously working no, with local it's... authority. Exactly. And it's, and, and, you know, and it, it, it is, it is about choice, you know, people want to live in these period properties because they're absolutely beautiful. Um, and, but, you know, you know, actually, if, if they're, if, if you're going to treat the kitchen as quite a, a functional, um, you know, functional item, um, you know, this customer's take on it is, well, actually, I want it easy to clean. I want it durable. I want it, you know, not to be affected by the U. I mean, we are getting rid of the most of the, most of the UV with the glazing. Mm -hmm. I want it, you know, to be UV affected, um, which, you know, sort of painted finishes and, um, you know, all painted finishes, including as painted finishes and, and, and wood finishes are more susceptible to. Um, so yeah, you know, it, it, it's functional, it's easy to clean, it's got all the little functional details in it, like the raised up dishwasher off the floor, flush hob, which is easy to wipe down, you know, so it, it's just a really sort of timeless, simple piece of kit, um, but it's got all the, all the mod cons sort of shoehorned in there. Mm -hmm. And speaking of mod cons, let's just go on to your next one, because this is a much more modern design in terms mm -hmm. of the extension is more modern, the property itself is more modern. So talk me briefly through this one and how this came about. 
Yeah, I mean, th this this would be a sort of very typical project for us, you know, both in terms of, you know, here, here in the Northwest, but also, I mean, this one is in the Northwest, but also sort of um, in, 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 in London, you know, with these Victorian homes with the, the, the ground floor extensions on them. And I mean, this is just showing a very typical way we'd approach a space, you know, so you've got the you've got the soft seating in there. Uh, you've got the, the the large family kitchen um, and uh, you know the, the the glazing going out onto the onto the garden. Um, there is actually a dining table um, almost in in the larger picture there. The dining table is just behind where the the photographer is uh, is um, got got the tripod basically when the picture is taken. But what you can see here is almost like the purest way that we would design a kitchen. So making the island into a very pure workbench, sink and hob on the island. So in the nicest possible way, we're sort of forcing the cook to always look, you know, work looking out of out into the space. Eye contact with family and guests. They're actually over, you know, actually looking over to a to a television as well, if that if that's your thing. Um, people automatically sit at the bar and converse. Um, and then you've just got your pocket of work surface on the back there, which just house, you know, those worktop items that we all have. We like to think that we haven't, but everybody has a toaster, maybe a small coffee machine. Um, so that's a sort of nice little area just to, just to house those things away because you, you know, you obviously can't have them out on an island. You know, it's been dangerous and look, you know, look horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, an amazing I connection to the outdoors. I'm going to um, just come on to bring us back in because we're getting a few questions in and I really um, want to get on to some of those as well. But just before, I want to talk to you both um, really briefly. What is your golden rule for a successful kitchen extension? Helen, do you want to go first? Oh, golden rule. Um, I'd say, I mean, we've discussed about lifestyle, but you do need to have a list of must-haves so um, things that you would want in, in your new kitchen project. So it is good to actually have an idea because there's so many components of a kitchen that if you literally have no clue and you haven't done any research at all, it's very difficult to, to actually start giving a client what they want. Yeah. Um, so I would say, I mean, you couldn't have get, got two different kitchen uh, companies from different ends of the spectrum. I mean, I love what Alex is, has done with that. I mean, the, the sort of glass box outside, it, it, it's like, wow, you know, it's completely um, amazing. So, um, so you can see the difference with the kitchen projects from the ones that you've seen of Berlain's and of Alex's company as well. So as long as you've got a fairly good idea of what you want to achieve, your list of must-haves. Um, the, the next thing is finding the right kitchen company for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's massively important because, you know, we do want to give the clients what they want to achieve, so. Mm -hmm. And Alex, what's your golden rule for a successful kitchen extension? Um, I, think, um, I think for me, it, it, it really is that thing of, you know, getting, getting the flow and, and the layout right, you know, at, at the planning stage. You know, we don't want to be moving kitchens around and building work around while on site. You know, that's expensive. You know, make all the mistakes at the planning stage with the architect and, a, and, a, and an experienced kitchen planner. Um, and, you know, you know, um, you know and, and get that flow right, you know. And no matter what the kitchen, you know, whether it's the more sort of contemporary styling or the, uh, you know, the, the in-frame traditional sort of construction, um, which you know, you know, we 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 actually also do as well. Um, but you know, for, for me, it, it, it's all about that layout, you know, and, and and getting that flow and getting people working in the right areas and not tripping over each other. Um, and that's typically how we win a lot of our business. You know, actually getting getting that right at the at the first stage, and then it's like right now, what do you want to look like? You know, uh, to, you know, um, uh, what what style do you do do you want to go for? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to come on to some questions because a lot of the questions are tied into what you've both been saying already. So, um, the first one I want to address is islands. So, um, we talked a lot about islands being a dream sort of aspirational thing in a kitchen. Which way should the island face in a in an extension? Alex, do you want to take that one? Um, uh, very difficult to say without seeing the the, the individual plan. Um, I mean, the 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 two the two 
projects that we showed of ours there, um, what you had is it, they, they were sort of almost per perpendicular to, to the entrance um, and, and the garden. So actually what you weren't doing is in either, you weren't looking directly at the garden with your back to the entrance of the room. Um, but on the other hand, you also just weren't looking at the entrance with your back to, to, the, to, to the garden. So it was almost trying to get them on the side. And obviously that's not always going to be possible in every space, of, of course not. Um, but typically we would, we would try to um, almost keep it yeah, perpendicular to, to, to an entrance and, and to a garden and that way the cook can, can you know, and, or, or, you know, which is based the homeowner, um, you know, and, he, and if they've got, a, you know, a beautiful arga like in um, Helen's project, you know, maybe we'd, we'd put a prep sink on the island and, uh, and, and, and their knives in a drawer and things and try and encourage them to use the island when they're prepping. They're greeting people as they're coming in, but they also get to enjoy the views outside. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be different for every. Um, I wanted to dodge the question. <laughs> it's going to be different for every um, every project. But it goes back to thinking about you know how you want to use the space, how sociable oh. you want to be within the space. Who else is going to be in there when you're in there? And thinking exactly, and exactly, and uh, yeah, it, it's getting those people, um, getting those different areas and those people in in, in the right place. I, I think then allows you to actually quite simply pan kitchen on how you physically cook and plate up a meal becomes quite easy once everybody's um you know where, where they need to be mm -hmm. next question is um as well lindsay so just what else you want to get in that room it depends on the size of the island that if you need a dining room table or um a seating area or stuff like that so you can change the shape of the island so it hasn't always got to be just rectangular um, you know, so that's something for a designer to look at, but they would always recommend that once you've got the full um, details of what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. It doesn't have to just be a box island. One of the other questions that um, has come in as kitchen is really busy and some big extensions I've been in are really echoey. Can we do anything about that? So Helen, do you want to um, answer that one? Yeah, I think with, like we said earlier, with big spaces, um, you don't want just a big hole, you know, where there's, like you say, it's not homely and stuff like that. I think what we're trying to achieve is various different areas within the one room. So you have got the kitchen, you have got the soft seating area, um, you might have a home office in there now, a lot of people are working from home, so you know, the kitchen or the family room has almost had to go like a study also. Um, a lot of my friends that have got children and stuff, obviously they want the kids in there maybe while they're cooking dinner um, and the children are doing homework and so forth. Um, you know, electronics is a big thing when, when you're talking about that space. But I think if you're not going to put a lot of products in the room, then you have got this sort of concave kind of area um, but if it is if it's designed right then it just will never feel like that it will be a homely functional room that probably is the most well used room in the house I mean a lot of people who have these extensions don't end up using their front room and other sort of um, reception rooms they spend most of their time within this room mm -hmm. And it's about materials as well. You know, ultimately, if you've got a, a huge room and you tile the whole thing, and then you've got stone kitchen work surfaces and, and the rest of it, you you are going to have to soften it down. You know, um, and whether that's you know large rugs and you know, obviously yeah, it depends what you do in a space. But you know, the rugs and things helps zone the room, as Helen's saying. Um, you know, visually, but it will also help dampen the sound down because ultimately, if your extension, you know. You could walk into a space realistically that in in, in the northwest, or and I'm sure where, where Helen is, you know, it, it can be ten meters by ten meters, and if it's all tiled, <laughs> um, uh, and and it's got a, a pitched roof on it, it it, it is gonna it, it, it can it can give that sort of echoey kind of cavernous feel. So it, it does just need softening with with the right furnishing and the right materials. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of questions in um, about bifolds and some on appliances. So I'll talk about bifolds first. So great in the day, this person says, but when it gets dark, how do you kind of light the kitchen to stop 
it becoming a big mirror. So I guess that's around privacy. Either of you? Helen, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, I mean, when you look into bifolds, I mean, it's not an area, obviously, that we do too much, but only through with extensions, I've seen them. Um, there is a lot of bifolds that you can actually get that have blinds inside. Um, so it's not like you're not going to have any curtains or it's going to be completely open. I mean, some people do. Um, we've seen some of our clients have got sort of Roman blinds, so they pull it down, you know, and they will go to the floor. Um, but the, the blinds in the bifolds are very good, but I believe they're fairly expensive to do that. Um, so, yeah, either or, really. Again, it depends if you're going to keep the, the contemporary look or if you want to soften it, you know, and like Alex said, with material and furnishings. Yeah. And then appliances are a big thing to think about when you're doing a kitchen, um, no matter if you're extending or not. One of the um, questions is, what are the options for extraction on a peninsula, so a hob inset or a vaulted roof extension? So how do you get around extraction um, in that sort of a space, a vaulted roof space? Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, pretty much these days, Gone are the days of having, you know, inverted steel T shapes hanging down into rooms. You know, visually, they were they were never great. Um, uh, you know, the the, the answer um, really um, is in within the new the new downdraft technology um, that, that's come into the marketplace over the last five years. So, you know, for for donkey's years, you've had extraction extractors that. Um, either popped out from the from the work surfaces or were laid in next to the hobs, um, but they offered a very very poor solution um, because heat and steam, by their very nature, the physics of it, they they want to go up. Um, actually, a small tweak that was only a small tweak in the technology and how they worked um, by um, a, I'm not sure I don't know if it's supposed to be dropping names or not, so I won't say anything. But a certain German company. Um, came up with a, a very simple principle of moving the moving the air in a slightly different way, and basically has revolutionised the industry overnight. Um, and now the extraction um, that is integrated into the hobs works incredibly well. Um, and so, coming up three years, unless we've been doing something like Naga, um, we've only sold one type of hob now, which is the, 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 the new generation of extraction integrated into hobs and basically it takes everything down as, as it cooks. Um, and when you watch videos on YouTube and things like that of these products, you, they work so well, you, you would think the videos have been you know, doctored um, because they're, they're, that, they're that effective. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was completely proven wrong by these products. You know, I, I was a complete cynic. I said they wouldn't work um, because for donkey's years they didn't. Um, and and they, they're, um, they're on the upper echelons of the price, price points. However, when you consider that it is a hob, a cooking hob, and an extractor combined into one, actually they come out about right, you know, what you would normally be spending on a hob and an extractor. And actually, they, they just give you that, that open plan lifestyle. You don't need extractors hanging into rooms. Um, you can do lighting above the islands, keep it all looking very furniture-like. Um, so they, they really are a, a, a worthwhile investment. It's one appliance that I, would, I always encourage people to spend that little bit extra on because it, just, it gives you that lifestyle that we're, we're, we're basically talking about in, in, you know, in the, for the last hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the sight line is great because you don't have any interruption. Yeah. Now, um, Helen, really quickly, we've got about two minutes. Um, if you don't have room for an island, what can you do instead? Not have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends because it, it goes on the shape of the room. But like you said, a peninsula is actually, I mean, we all know what a peninsula is, but to the lay person, it is attached to a wall. So it comes off. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, but it does depend on the space, really. You can have a breakfast bar or, you know, if it's a seating area like that. But you can't really recreate the island if there just isn't the room. And sometimes you're better off to just leave it. You know, there's no point in trying to cram an island that's sort of a metre wide. It's, uh, 
it's not good. But the other thing we do is you can have a chef's table. That might work if it's a little bit smaller. And is that something that's portable or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. At the chef's table, it kind of can move and so you, you can move it around, but it's something that if you're going to do it on a smaller scale, it looks better. An island needs to be quite substantial, really. But I was just going to say quickly, just with regards to um, the extraction on the island, you do have to bear in mind if it's a new build, um, that it probably will be have to duct out as opposed to recirculating. So again, that's what you need to do in the early plans. Something to discuss with your kitchen designer, as everything is throughout yeah. the project. Now, thank you both very, very much. I'm going to have to draw it to a close. We could talk about this for hours, I'm sure. But thank you for giving up your time today. And thank you for everyone who's tuned in and um, hope this has been useful for you. And don't forget, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search KBB Magazine on there. And then you can watch this and previous episodes as well. And keep an eye out on our social media for upcoming events as as well but for now have a lovely day and thank you very much bye bye thank you